Hello, and welcome back to the stories that brought you here. It's the podcast dedicated to the stories of the people from Pender Island, British Columbia. Once again, I am your host, Chris Wakaluk, and I'll be sitting down in one-on-one hour-long conversations with current Pender Island residents to hear the stories that brought them to this musical little island we live on, and to also hear the stories that brought them to the point that they're at in their lives right now. Today, I'll be speaking with John Gowan. Now, if you know John like I know John, then you're going to know him as that guy that hosts the Socrates Cafe at the libraries. Well, we're going to get to hear John talk about that and a heck of a lot more. We're going to get to hear John discuss his 40-year career as a musician for the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. As previously mentioned, we'll get to hear John talk about his experiences hosting the Socrates Cafe at the library which is a philosophical discussion group that's been occurring on the island for a number of years. John will also speak about his love of reading and his involvement in book clubs, along with a lot more, in an episode that really goes deep into exploring somebody's extensive background with music. And, you know, it was really interesting to get to hear somebody speak at length about the intricacies and the intimacies of Basically, their entire life of playing music. It's really amazing. So I really enjoyed sitting down with John and having some good chats, some good conversations about things, and I hope you enjoy it too. We'll see you on the other side, and here is my interview with John Gowan. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's a real pleasure that you're here. I just finished telling you twice already. I'm like, I'm so happy that you're here. But <laughs> anyway, and uh, you made it. Uh, you made it through uh, my snowy driveway together. Absolutely, here. absolutely, no problem. All right, perfect. Okay, well, jumping into the first traditional question we always get to on this podcast, and that is, of course, what brought you to Pender Island? Oh boy. Okay, that was my daughter moved uh, about six years ago, seven years ago to North Vancouver. And we wanted to visit her. So we came out and uh, she was managing a Starbucks in North Vancouver. And then we decided that, well, she decided to uh, start talking to this young fellow that, on his way to work that was getting a coffee every morning. And one thing led to another and they got engaged. And we thought, okay, uh, he lives on Pender or his mom lives on Pender. So we decided to uh, go and meet the mom after they got engaged. And we got to Pender and, oh my God, this is where we want to retire. And that's basically the story. We started looking at houses, even went to Salt Spring, which didn't work out well. But uh, we found the house on Pender that we always wanted. Top of a hill, great view. It's awesome. We love it here. Okay. And so it was it was basically through your daughter meeting a, uh, a young yeah. gentleman. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And who who is the uh, the woman who is the mother of this young man? Oh, Jan Kirkby is, is the mom and Brady Kirkby is her son. And yeah, they lived on I've lived on Pender for years and years and years. So he grew up here, went to school here. He even has a, a moss, I think, that he discovered, named after him, that he discovered here. So very smart guy, and I'm glad my daughter's married to him. Okay, and what was uh, the first year that you came to Pender? Boy, let me think, six years ago, that would make it uh, 2013. Okay, 2013. All right. And so what was it about coming to Pender that first really drew you in? Was it the, the beauty, being by the ocean? It was, yeah. it was all of that. The beauty, the ocean. I mean, I'm, I'm not particularly a, a water person, but I've, I've loved mountains all my life. And, and my God, there they are. It's, it's, it's perfect. It just felt like home here right from the very beginning. Yes, we've gone to other islands, but this is the one we chose. This, this is just perfect for us. Interesting. You know, I've heard a few people say that, that it, uh, it feels like home right off the bat to yeah. them because you're originally from back east in uh, yep. Toronto. Toronto, Stratford. Yeah. Okay. And so that sense of home, was that the first time that you had experienced that in your life or it just felt like a different kind of a home to you? Or You know, it's weird. I'm, I'm a little bit strange because every place that I've gone to uh, that I've lived with, lived in, the next place that I lived in, I always think fondly of the last place I lived in. Last place I lived in was Stratford, Ontario, which was a great house, and the kids grew up, and we had a big dog and lots of cats, and it was it was awesome. But once I've been here, I think fondly of Stratford, but I don't miss it. 
I don't miss it like I, I would have somewhere else. Pender is it. That's why I'm here. That's why Liz and I are here. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, let's delve into uh, what you were doing before you decided to make the move to Pender Island. And uh, you sent me an email with a lot of information describing your life leading up to uh, this, which I asked you for. And here we go. I'm really intrigued to uh, get into this. But you have a a serious music background that you had uh, before moving here. But uh, take it away on uh, telling myself and the listeners as to what your working background musically was. All right. Well, the first thing, this is very boring. I started piano when I was four, and I would rather be playing road hockey. So I was one of those kids. Uh, then I got to junior high school, and I got to my very first music class late, and the double bass was all that was left. So that's how I got started playing the double bass. And once I picked it up, it just hit, and I haven't quit since I retired. <laughs> I haven't played. But, yeah, from there on, I I just went through high school and playing the bass and got involved in all different kinds of bands. But the symphony was, was what I was always aiming for, basically. And and by the time I'd finished high school, I went into U of T and did four years there. And in my last year, I got the job, auditioned and got the job in the Toronto Symphony, stayed there for about 42 years. That's the story. <laughs> okay, so Toronto Symphony for 42 years. Yeah. Okay, yep. so what uh, what year was the first year that uh, you joined the symphony? The first year was 1972, so it was the 1972-1973 season, and the season started with playing operas, which was which was great because I'd never played an opera before. I hadn't played a whole lot of music before because I was kind of a, a rock and roller and a, and a jazz player before. And when I started to take the bass seriously, I decided that I better go to university, but I had limited experience with classical music, so everything was brand new to me, and and it was a steep learning curve to say to say the very least. When I got into the symphony, it took hours and hours of practicing and you know trying to figure out how I fit in, kind of thing. But uh, eventually, it happened. So yeah. When you were going to school, was that a dream that you had to to join that? Like, was that the vision for a long time, or what? Uh, what eventually led you to that place? Well, I, my first year in university was uh, in music education, which which meant that I was going to be a teacher after four years. And my teacher at that point decided that I was probably in the wrong track. I mean, although I love teaching and I have taught all my career, it was more playing that I was interested in because I practiced more than I did any any of the other (laughs) things I should have been doing at university. So uh, second year, I applied to enter into the performance department and got in after multiple tries, (laughs) put it that way. They see they made money off people in education and they did not performers. So they, they wanted me to stay in education, but I said no. And I got into performance performance in second year and stayed till fourth and then got the job in the orchestra okay and you mentioned that you uh you toured extensively when you were with the uh oh, symphony as well too. yes everywhere right from oh europe i don't know how many times uh australia far east we even did a tour up uh northern canada to tuk to we we were there but there was uh it was the yukon in general and we had a great exchange week with with the local indigenous people up there and you know they played for us we'd play for them and we'd throw a party and they'd throw a party and we had a we had a great time but yeah toured extensively all over the place i don't know if there's any favorite places uh, the only continents i haven't really been to are africa and south america and, and i'm bound and determined to get there one day but uh yeah it, it's a lot of touring it's, it's like join an orchestra see the world kind of thing at least back then uh right now the well, it's getting back, but but for a long time there wasn't a whole lot of uh, extra money for orchestras to tour because it's a very expensive thing to do. But it's coming back. The orchestra is touring more. I'm just not in it, so yeah, I, I live vicariously. Nice. Well, <laughs> if there's anything, uh, any particular stories that you want to tell about certain situations that happened because it's 40 years of being a professional musician (laughs) and uh it's funny when you sent me the email and i was looking through it i thought oh my gosh this is amazing this man spent 40 years being a professional musician for a symphony this is really incredible what are some of uh some stories you'd like to tell from uh your your past in doing that all right well first of all it's like that old line what what goes on on tour stays on tour that that's that's one of the things but 
I think mostly it was all about this kid from Toronto who didn't know his ass from his elbow all of a sudden being on an airplane for the first time and and flying to all these amazing cities and and playing concerts and and you know getting to know the people in the orchestra it, it was it was it was magic for me it was absolute magic and it never quit it just never quit not in all the years that that I was in the orchestra it just kept happening over and over again like going to china for instance we did china in 1978 and we were the first orchestra to go there after the cultural revolution Sorry, first Canadian orchestra after the Cultural Revolution. I think Philadelphia had gone before us, but just learning how to eat with chopsticks or you starve. <laughs> and the, the food, we had no idea what we were eating. We had absolutely no idea, but it was all delicious. And, it, you know, we, the, the kind of standard joke was we could see the chefs laughing in the, in the, in the kitchen. Hey, we fed them that and they ate it. So, but <laughs> yeah, people, people made the orchestra for me. Uh, so many people in, in, over the years. I'm, I, I could mention all the players in the bass section that, that I know and love, but uh, they're they're family, they're family, and, and that's that's what happens after a few years. You actually think of the the orchestra, even though it's maybe a hundred people, as your family, family away from your family. Okay. Well, it's interesting the idea of how much, how many people are actually involved in an orchestra to begin with. Well, how many people typically were in the orchestra that you're playing with at one time? Okay, ninety six on contract, which uh, means that there are so many violins, first and second violins, violas, cellos, basses, uh, clarinets, horns, bassoons. I can't forget bassoons. My wife plays a bassoon. Uh, trumpet players, trombone players. There's there's a lot of people. And it's uh, a lot of the repertoire from the late 1800s to the 1900s demands that kind of full sound. Uh, a lot of 20th century stuff does too. But you really need that amount of people because there's there's colors that are written by the composers that they want to hear. And you can't get that with one or two instruments or, God forbid, a, a synthesizer. A synthesizer just can't match the depth of the amount of instruments. And you can you can hear that in, like if you go to a, a pit and listen to a, a stage show or whatever, and, and they've replaced any number of instruments with synthesizers, a synthesizer, it just doesn't sound right. It sounds okay. And the singers would be fine and, and things, but, but it's just not the same. And Broadway discovered that after they'd gone to synthesizers for years, and now they're back to full orchestras back in their pits. So it took a while, but uh, it's, uh, it's back. Live music is best, right? Was it the audience that was really identifying that, or was it the... Uh... Well, to save money, first of all, sure. for the theater owner. But the, the audiences were a little less than happy with, you know, if you, if you go to a, a city that, that has a... A populace that is educated in classical music or wants to hear what they what they hear on a record, then you have to have a real orchestra instead of a synthesizer. But I, I shouldn't disparage them because they really do have their place and they're you know they're part of our collective as well. So there there really are places, and one one of them might be instead of having ten or twelve canon. In the Tchaikovsky's eighteen twelve overture, you can press a button and have the cannons blast off right when you need them. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. So yeah, funny. Uh, well, you know, I'm so curious about what a typical work week might have looked like for you back in the day, uh, uh, but but then also how that evolved over forty years as well too. If there's any changes, because I only have my imagination to go on about somebody who works in the symphony. What do they do in a typical week? Okay, it changed. Uh, obviously, when I first started, we started on Sunday, but then the contract decided uh, we negotiated away from Sundays because that was a family day. Anyway, so we got to Monday, and there's probably a rehearsal in the morning that starts at 10. This is all at the concert hall. Uh, rehearsal from 10 to 12.30 and lunch, and then a, a, another rehearsal from one thirty to 4. Tuesday, probably around the same thing, 10 to 12.30, 1.30 to 4.00. Wednesday is the dress rehearsal, 10 to 12.30, and then the concert at 8 o'clock at night. Thursday, concert, just a concert at 8 o'clock at night. Uh, Friday, generally free. You might have other things you want to do, like freelance stuff or, or you know, teaching or stuff. Saturday, there could often be a concert on Saturday night. 
And again, Sunday is free. So it all works out to the basic standard industry standard is about 20 and a quarter hours a week of actual playing, but that doesn't include the practicing and you know, the teaching and, and everything else. So you have to sometimes make a living there doing other things. Okay. But, and you were making a living doing teaching on the side as well too. Yeah. Yeah. I started off with uh, just t teaching privately about 1974 or five. And then I got a class of about 30 students and the Royal Conservatory didn't like that I was on my own. So they decided that they wanted me in their fold. So I went there and then I started teaching at U of T, taught there for 10 years, taught one year at University of Western Ontario when their bass player went on sabbatical. But uh, it was fun. I love teaching. I just seeing that this is mostly just private stuff. At U of T, I taught a, a course in chamber music and the course that took all the music education kids this is your introduction to the double bass, and in six weeks or six months, you're going to have to learn how to teach it yourself. So that was pretty intense. You have to really get the kids involved in in learning how. But mostly, as I've said to them, okay, I'll teach you as far as I can go. But when, you, please, when you've exhausted your knowledge, send them to a teacher. So, but anyway, that was big part of my life for a very long time. I really, really enjoyed it. I do miss the kids. I still keep in contact with a lot of them. A lot of them are playing in orchestras all around the world and doing very well. And, and thank God for Facebook because I can keep up, keep up with them. And I know Facebook isn't, isn't great, but it's, it's a really easy way for, way for me to keep up with people that I, I knew back then. So Nice. Yeah. And here I am on Pender. I'm nowhere near anybody I taught. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's interesting. Like, do you still play music on the side? No, 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 no. I quit. Uh, first of all, the reason I stopped playing and retired was that my hearing went. If you sit in front of a brass section and trumpet players for 40 odd years, you're going to lose some hearing. And one day I realized I couldn't hear the first violins when I needed to. And that was sort of the beginning of the end for me. And you go through all the testing and the Okay, well, you, you need hearing aids. Okay, thank you. And I can't hear my wife, especially when I need to. <laughs> that, that wasn't a good thing either. And <laughs> I tried wearing my hearing aids first time on stage, and they fed back. There was feedback so bad that, that you know, conductors looking, everybody's looking around at me. You know, better turn them off. And I figured that was the beginning of the end. I had to, I had to stop. And it was fine. Uh, I continued on as a librarian for a couple of years after that, so, so which was something I had done all along anyway. Just a little bit of extra money here and there. So, by librarian, you mean librarian with the uh, the musical sheets? Yes, yeah. the, mu the music. Yes, uh, the Toronto Symphony. Well, most big orchestras have huge libraries that that contain thousands and thousands of folders with music that have to be sorted and, and prepared and all kinds of things. And it's a, it's a huge job. Usually there's three or four librarians per orchestra that need to do all the music, prepare the music for the for the players on the first rehearsal. So, yeah. And it's a lending library, too. You have to lend out the parts ahead of time for people to practice, which is a big part of what you do. That's interesting. I never knew that that, part, that job existed within that, uh, that culture, but that's kind of amazing. You, you have to have librarians. Oh, to absolutely. Yeah, essential part to it. Do you, do you miss the music at all, or how are you feeling about that? You know what? I, people have asked me that so many times, and yes, I've, of course I miss the people and, and the situations you find in the stories and, and all of that stuff. I, of course I miss that, but once again, I might be weird, but I don't think so. I think there are other people that can do this too. If I've played something more than once, it's in my head. I can play it whenever I feel like. And, uh, you know, if I want to play ba Beethoven 5 all the way through, but I can play it the way I want to because it's in my head, right? I can make it louder, softer, slower, fast, whenever I want to. But uh, do I still listen to music? Yeah, of course. Um, my wife still plays the bassoon, and we were listening to Shostakovich Violin Concerto because she's going to be playing it next week. And we were listening to it on our speaker. And, and you know, it took me back. It took me back, back to when I was playing it. So it's fun. I, I love doing that, too. 
Nice. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine all those years being surrounded by that much uh, musical beauty and being being a part of it to part to create it, obviously, and being I, I can understand why you would probably feel a deep connection with the people that uh, you're working with to bring those pieces to life yep. week after week, month yep. after month, year after year, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, really, and there are so many great people and characters too. And uh, once again, they. I, won't mention any names, but uh, there there are enough characters in an orchestra that make every rehearsal really interesting. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Let's hear for those people. All right. Well, you and your wife moved here to Pender Island uh, not too long ago. And, you know, th- the way that uh, I've just recently got to know you actually is through the uh, Socrates Cafe. That is a get together at the libraries on Wednesdays and Thursdays. That is uh, philosophical discussions with uh, groups of people based on a sentence that is being uh, discussed. And you've been hosting that for a few years. And mm-hmm. yeah, I just actually thought it was a really interesting event. I've only attended two so far, but I've really been blown away by how uh, fun they are and stimulating. But how did you get involved with the Socrates Cafe? Okay, a friend of mine named Chris Scattergood started the Socrates Cafe, I guess, about four years ago. And uh, he felt he couldn't continue as leading it, which is fine. And he asked me if I take over. And, and I said, how can I do that? I've never looked at philosophy before at all. And, I mean, I'd read a book called Sophie's World once. That was a philosophy, like a 101 philosophy book. And that was my full extent. And then I realized that the topics that were were chosen, I mean, they could take a philosophical bent, and sometimes did. Some people would would you know drop names like Socrates and Plato, but but most of the time it was a, an adult discussion group. And if I had any mission at all, it was it, I noticed that there were a lot of people that that came that didn't speak, and it was my goal to help them be able to speak so that their voice could get heard too in the discussion. And and it's happened for a lot of people. It's it's great. And the most amazing thing happened is is that it grew from the, a start of maybe four or five people in a living room, and now there's 74 people that take part, not every week. Uh, some people come some weeks, some people others. So there's usually about 25 to 30 on Wednesday afternoon, and God, last, last Thursday there were 16 on Thursday night, which was unheard of. We usually have maybe seven or eight, but it was doubled. I guess the topic was good, but but it, it's it's come along really well, and it's a, it's a safe place for you to come and air your intuitions, your ideas, and and have a good time, and cookies, of course, and coffee, and <laughs> all of those things are important too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was so impressed the first time I went. I actually showed up late, and uh, and the the topic I think was is the word old the pejorative, <laughs> and you're talking to the guy. <laughs> that's old anyway well yeah i i actually didn't partake in that one because i i felt uh as if it was a little rude of me to be coming in late for my first time and i was just sort of witnessing what was going around um and it was it was such an amazing thing i i knew about half the people in the room and the other half of the people i'd never really seen before but it seemed uh as if it was such uh open event for people just to explore their feelings, not yes. necessarily just thoughts, but feelings. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a safe environment. Uh, that's what I hope to create it. Or I think I have created a, a very safe environment for people to just air whatever they want to. Every once in a while, somebody gets really, really upset. And that's, of course, that's allowed. But usually it's a, it, it's pretty on a, much on an even keel and people are, are quite happy you know, I send out uh, readings for Thursday and Wednesday on the topic so people can have a little bit of a head start on, on forming their ideas or their opinions. And sometimes it helps. Some people don't read them at all. And some people just like to come in without any preparation. And a lot of people read the stuff or listen to the stuff. YouTube is big. I find a lot of stuff on YouTube that I can find for people that don't like reading so much. But there are articles. I Google everywhere. So... <laughs> I've been a, a black belt in Google now, I think. A black belt in Google. <laughs> Watch out. It's coming to get your karate chop. <laughs> well, it's it's a really cool event, and I look forward to going to more. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's something that I'd never actually even heard about until a couple months ago. And uh, I was really impressed with something like that existing on the island and giving people an opportunity to sit in a circle together and look in each other's eyes and have a conversation, a dialogue that goes beyond the depth of what we normally have on right. the island, which is 
pretty superficial most of the time at the grocery store, you know, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. but it, the, yeah. the depth of conversation is, uh, it's amazing. Oh, the thing is that, that there are Socrates cafes all over the world. There's, uh, at least two that, three that I know of in New York. There's one, um, there's one in Toronto that I know of. Um, there, they exist everywhere. A lot of the ideas I get for topics, people from other Socrates cafes print what they've been talking about online and I can get those ideas and copy them down. But it was started, oh man, there's a book. I wish I could remember the author's name. It's just called the Socrates Cafe. And it's he's the one guy that started it just basically be, because he thought there was a need for people to get together and talk about interesting things that, that you could get a little depth with. And uh, not always philosophical, but but usually it, it can get there. And I think the standard is that you should come away from a Socrates cafe knowing less than when you went in. Oh, knowing less than when knowing you went in. Knowing less than when you went in because you've thought about stuff again. Mm. Okay, and yeah. maybe reordered your reordered your thinking or, or learned something you didn't know and how that changed your view. And usually, uh, I mean, the first few times I came away, like my head was like spinning. Wow, I never thought of it that way or, or this way. And there are so many professionals in the group that, that have a great deal of knowledge, uh, scientists, uh, philosophers, psychiatrist, well, musician. Uh, <laughs> but but there's uh, very, very many different backgrounds involved. And there's always a different perspective, a different per opinion that, that will come out that might change the way you think and make you think again. So then you have to go away thinking, oh, I didn't know that. And I know less than when I, when I went in because now I've got to change the way I think. Absolutely. Yeah. After the last one I went to on the Thursday, my mind was just firing for days yeah. thinking about all the different uh, good, opinions good, that good, had come good. up and thoughts on a particular subject that we broached. But And it's amazing what you can learn by talking to people. Uh, you, you and I were just talking about a generator that I have at my house oh. and some problems <laughs> I had with it. And me just talk, talking about my issues with the generator you gave me some great advice that your neighbor gave you. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to talk to people and discuss things. But uh, I, I guess actually leading it to that is uh, the second traditional question we get to on this podcast is uh who's given you help along the way on pender island since you've been here and, oh uh, boy oh i wish i could name all of them it isn't time but but the primary people that have given me help on the island when i moved here i mean basically i moved from a, a an urban to a rural community and and i mean you go camping and it's not the same <laughs> it's just not the same when you when you live in it but we have uh, a neighbor named Donna Smythe and her husband Vernon, who just recently passed away. And the two of them together have been absolutely amazing in, in terms of the wealth of information that they've they've given us to survive and, and have fun. And uh, there was a neighbor across the street, Heath. He's a contractor and told me how to sharpen it, you know, showed me how to sharpen a chainsaw. Vern taught me how to get my generator going, uh, what kind of gas to use, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Socially, basically Socrates has been pretty good for that. You know, I'm not the easiest person to, I kind of hold back a bit in terms of when I go to meet people and, but just getting to know these soccer, all, all the people in Socrates, it's been awesome because it's like I have a whole new family on Pender I didn't know I had. It's great, um, including Chris, who's sitting right across from me. So, yeah, it's been really good in, in terms of social. And then there's the there was the newcomers group for a while, and there's still a we go to dinner once a month for appies and stuff, and that, that's fun too. Uh, met painters, the painters, and the the people that are involved in the not just the artistic life, but in actually running Pender as well. So it, it's been a good group really good social experience for me first few people you mentioned there were your neighbors yes yeah so people living uh, in close proximity and i know that you mentioned that uh, Vern passed away yep just about a month about ago about a month ago yeah. yeah yeah but he was he was a big influence on you huge huge he had uh, a little beer garden that he set up and and he and my wife would would go up and have a beer every now and again in the afternoon and uh, it was a really really nice social time going for dinner there going out to the pub just just hanging out with these great people it was terrific and Vern introduced me to the golf course and i don't play golf which is 
kind of weird because nobody on the crew that does the the groundskeeping they all play golf and I don't, but that's okay. That's but you still a, have not taken I, up golf yet. I still haven't taken up golf yet. No, okay. I. <laughs> We'll see. I've got the clubs. I bought a I bought a set of clubs from <laughs> from the golf course, and I think they were fifty bucks. And I'll I'll give them a shot. The one time I actually did go out, Vern was with me, and he was, he was saying, "Okay, well, this is how you putt," and my ball was on the on the, on the green, and he, he said, "Okay, well, putt it towards my feet," and he was probably about eight feet away from the cup, and I putted towards his feet, and the ball went in the hole. I couldn't believe it. He was he was a great golfer. Eh? So is his wife Donna, but uh, it's a whole it's a whole uh, work crew socialization thing that on Monday mornings, and and we get to rake the sand traps and cut the weeds and and cut the brambles back and make sure the course is looking good. That's fun. Cookies and coffee for payment. It's all volunteer. It's great. Yeah, you know the golf course is so amazing. I don't golf either, but every now and then they'll have some disc golf that will uh, happen on the golf course. Oh right! Oh, do you play disc golf? Oh, I love disc golf. Oh, uh, I'm kind okay. of fanatic about it. But every time I go on that golf course, I'm blown away by how beautiful it is. It really doesn't feel like yeah. anywhere else on the island. Yeah, it, it's very well manicured, and the groundskeeper, the professional groundskeeper, is is absolutely terrific. He does a wonderful job, and the trees. Uh, you're right. It's just the whole layout of it is is absolutely beautiful. It's only nine holes, but it, it extends, you know, any number of acres around. And it's up the hill, down the hill. It, it's running river and, and oh, I can't say enough. The fresh air, the people, it's all great. It's a really good microcosm of a community right there in the golf course. And a great restaurant now. They've had trouble finding a restaurant that will stay up there. Evidently, they found one now that that uh, is doing really, really well. So yeah, I think it's called El Faro. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, they they do some tacos. That's right. And yeah. my my wife loves the soup, but uh, I haven't been there yet, so I, I have to have to try it out. I'm a big fish and chip person. Maybe I'll go Friday afternoon. I think that's the fish and chip day. They have. That's the fish and chip day, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Friday's fish and chips. Well, you mentioned your wife Liz a couple of times. How yes. did how did you wind up meeting your wife Liz? Oh boy, okay. This is a, any number of years ago, way over twenty-seven years ago, twenty-eight. Anyway, uh, we've been together for a long time. She was uh, and is a bassoonist, and she was playing in the Canadian Opera Company and the National Ballet and the Stratford Festival, and doing freelance work on the side as well. All this with two young kids, and uh, she subbed in one day. Uh, when we actually began to know each other, we were both married to other people. And then one day uh, she came to sub in the symphony and I asked her if she wanted to go out for coffee and we, it, it all worked from there. And uh, yeah, so all these number of years later, we're, we're good. It's still good. And moving to Pender was one of the best things we did. Liz still plays, still plays in the national ballet and Victoria symphony has got her playing when when they have a concert and they need her over there. So she's still very active playing, and I love it when she practices. It takes me back to when I used to practice. So. Yeah, because <laughs> you can hear in the background. It oh, yeah. It triggers the memories. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. Especially playing the pieces. Like if she's learning a piece that I've played, and it's like, oh, I remember that. Well, let's do it together. And, you know, I'll have all these memories, and she'll be trying to figure out how it works. But. Well, was that a fun part for you, learning the pieces? Because the, the practicing versus the performing, how was that? Practicing is never much fun. No. Okay. I used to tell my students that if you have a really, really bad day practicing, you've learned a lot more than if you've had a good day. Because if it's, if it's a good day and, and everything's flowing along and the fingers are working and the arms are working and the, the head is working, then everything is easy. It, it's fun, but you didn't learn anything. It's when things are a struggle that you really have to think about what you're doing and putting a finger here, putting a finger there. Maybe it's an up bow, a down bow, whatever. But practicing is a learning experience. And, and I think playing on stage is actually when you put all that learning together and just go in there and tell your story on the instrument. Tell yeah. your story on the instrument. Yeah. 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 When, when you're playing, how consciously aware are you of what you're doing or are you just embodying the moment and just letting the uh, the muscle memory work for you yeah basically it should be automatic 
um, so that it leaves your the the physical thing should be automatic in in terms of the hands and the whatever and and if you're a wind player the embouchure and everything but funny story about that is uh, w- one of my very first stand partners when I joined the orchestra in 1972 was a man named Sam Davis big Sam Davis it's from Vancouver and he'd been a wealth of experience. He'd played in Vancouver. He'd played in the big bands in London, England, and he'd, he'd, he'd been all around. And he had moved back down in the section. He was assistant principal and moved back down to train the new guy, which was me. And we're playing along, and I pooped in all the time, but just playing when I shouldn't have been playing, like an arrest or something, you know. Like, oh, geez, why did I do that? And people turn around, idiot. But <laughs> Sam never made a mistake. He never, ever made a mistake. And one day we were having coffee. I said, Sam, how come you don't make a mistake? I mean, I poop in all the times. And he said, oh, I count everything. I said, what do you mean? He says, I count everything. I said, okay, like 30 bars rest. Oh, I count the 30 bars rest. I don't wait for my ears to tell me when to play. I count myself. Okay, all right. Well, that makes sense. So I started trying it. And God, it was boring. You know, you want to wanted to leave your brain free to listen, but but then again, you, you've you got to come into the right place. So I started counting. And after a while, after a few years, it just became automatic. So you were listening and counting at the same time. And I pooped in way less frequently than I had before. So it's one of those things you learn from, you know, just doing it. You count everything. So yeah, yeah, lots of people help. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, it's interesting. I've never actually played uh, music very much myself, but the idea of being in that zone always seemed really kind of like appealing. Right. And like, I, it, it just is, a. Uh, I'm kind of I'm very envious. I actually have to say to be surrounded by music as your working life yeah. It's a chosen profession. And obviously it took a lot of work, but to be surrounded by that for decades just sounds really incredible. Yeah. The, the zone thing that's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. And, and, as a musician, that's what you try for. I mean, you you will never ever play a concert without a mistake. You you will always make a mistake. Okay, it, it's just too complex not to. So, the difference probably between you know somebody just starting out and a professional is that how fast you correct the mistake, so that you don't you know either do it again or think about it while the music's going by and then you're really lost. <laughs> so, but it's how fast you you correct uh, and. The zone is somewhere that you always want to be, but not always get there. I think in in the 40 years that I've played in the symphony, maybe I can count on my fingers and toes the number of time I was actually in the zone and totally unaware. It's like when you're driving in the desert and, and you've just driven 300 miles and you didn't know you'd driven. That's what the zone is. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and here you are playing great music it's very complex music and you have no idea that you've played it except that you knew you'd like you you loved it so yeah <laughs> that's now where you, the zone is yeah i don't even know where you were in the zone until you're <laughs> past the zone until the that's zone's right. over i i think i was in the zone yeah yeah oh there's clapping i guess it stopped <laughs> <laughs> wow i was in the zone i didn't that's even right. know that's so, right so you're not even consciously aware that no. you're in that state no. of flow okay. well, it's because you practiced everything to a, a degree that, that it just becomes automatic. You you play with what you hear. So, yeah. And again, you're telling a story. That's what you're, that's what you're doing. Uh, it, it may not be Beethoven's story. It may not be Berlioz's story. It may not be Bach's story, but it's your story. And you're making the sound that you want to make to tell that story. And yes, it has to fit with everybody else, which it should be, should do or change your story. But it's one of the, th- the great things that that if you play in an orchestra, there are solo players like the concert master and the first woodwinds and, and all that kind of stuff, and the trumpet players. But the rest of the guys uh, that fill out the orchestra, like the backs of the violin section, violas, cellos, and basses, we're, we're tutti. We're called tutti, which means all in Italian. And the conductor says something like, okay, I want it to sound this way. And the principal, your principal will say, okay, well, he says, sound it, make it sound this way. Yes, but you can make it sound your way, but it's your story. You can make it sound that way in within your story. So that's how I look at it. I used to tell kids when I was teaching that, that you know, you, you get some kids that, that really struggle with trying to make music. They're so, they really want 
to play music, but they haven't really figured out how to do it yet. They they've got all the physical things. They've got the notes down and they've got the you know the bow going or whatever, but it's not quite music yet. So I used to say to them, "Okay, I want you to think about this piece that you're playing, but I want you to think about the first, you know, four or five, six lines as a paragraph. And I want you to put a story to that and go away for a week and come back and tell me your story that that you've figured out about that music. And, and invariably it works. It, it's uh, just adding a dimension to, you know, instead of struggling with the, with the physical, they're able to free their minds up into something something quite different. It could be a painting. Think of a painting that this music might describe, and, and it usually comes back pretty well. That's interesting. So you would have to select specific imagery of your own to yes. develop a particular story. Yeah. Or, I mean, if it's a painting, or uh, I'd say, okay, what's your favorite book? What's your favorite book? Okay. Now, would you? how would you read that sentence? Would you read it in a monotone like this, or would you inflect? Would you say, oh, look at this, look at this, oh, wow, okay, and put an inflection in your voice so that, that it goes up and down and modulates and things. That's playing music. Right. And that's telling your story. Yeah. Interesting. So when you were playing, did you have particular imagery that was going through your mind or when you were doing certain pieces, you mm -hmm. had particular mm -hmm. stories for each piece? Yeah, it's part of the preparation. At least it was for me. A lot of guys don't need it, but for me, I need I needed to have a background on what the, who the composer was, when he lived, when he, you know, the history behind him, and you know whether he was whether he just you know lost his dog on that day and he wrote that piece that you you know and he was feeling sad. Okay, that's pretty obvious. But some composers are pretty wacky and they go for, <laughs> they go up and down in their emotions pretty quickly. But if you have a sense of the composer and the sense of the time he was writing as well, because there's different periods of music, obviously, and, and what works in one era doesn't work in another. But it's it's kind of a, a history lesson and just being able to commune a bit with that composer, just to f try and figure out what was he thinking? What was he feeling at that moment? Mostly what was he feeling? And then you can incorporate that into what you do. So for a number of the pieces that you're playing, there's literature that existed that exists that oh, oh explains. All kinds. God, yes, there's the, there's a, a museum, uh, there's a, a library in Toronto, the, the Toronto Music Library. That's it's, it's huge. It's huge. It goes every, it's, and there's the basic standby, which was my basic standby, was the Groves History of Music and Musicians, and there they give you little capsule comments and and little encyclopedic notes on, on the composer and what he was doing then and when he wrote this. And it's history. Neat. It's history. And yeah. so would people within your section and within the entire orchestra communicate these things with each other, discuss, oh, this is this piece and this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I was the go-to guy because I, I, that's what I like to do. I, I like to figure out who that composer was and, and maybe draw relationships to other composers or, or what he wrote. 10 years ago, maybe sounds like Shostakovich is a good case in point. If you hear something by Shostakovich, you know it's by Shostakovich. And how do you know that? Well, why is that different than Beethoven? Well, the, Beethoven wrote this way and Shostakovich wrote this way. There's a lot of dissonance and there's a lot of different effects that can, af that can happen in the music. And, and you just know that's who it is. And Prokofiev, same time as Shostakovich, both Russian and they're totally different composers, totally different. You know it's Prokofiev, you know it's Shostakovich, just like you know the difference between Beethoven and Berlioz. It's part of who they are is, is what they wrote and, and communing with them and, and being able to figure out who they were, how they were feeling, why they were feeling that. It's, it's very interesting. And a lot of it, you can get you know the basics of through a book by looking at an encyclopedia. Sure. Yeah, you know, that's super interesting. I'm really uh, blown away and impressed to hear that because that's really going such an extra distance in order to really feel and understand the music that you're playing. That's pretty wonderful. But you were saying you were the go-to guy. You were the person who really found this the most fascinating? Not all the time. Yeah, I found it fascinating if somebody wanted to ask. I never, I, I didn't volunteer. If somebody wanted to, you know, change their story or whatever, wanted some little information, I had it. But you know, very often I didn't need to say anything. It was just for me, just for me. And 
you know, I mean, I think you'd end up at, in a mental institution if you did it for every piece. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good point. But yeah, but I mean, there, there's there's plenty of pieces that you've played before. Uh, I mean, there's a probably a four or five year rotation on Beethoven symphonies. If you played it once, you've in a forty year career, you've probably played it about eight times. So you kind of know what's going on going in. Yeah. So you don't have to do it all the time. And there's pop shows, for instance. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, playing with Ella Fitzgerald. You you know Ella. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Okay. I mean, one of my all-time favorite singers. And, and this is years ago. And we played at a place in downtown Toronto called Ontario Place, which is right on the waterfront. It was great. It was the theater and people came and Ella Fitzgerald was playing and we, we had a rehearsal and it was terrific. And, you know, there's a supper break and you go away and then before the concert and, you know, I, usually on my own. So I, I walked off to my favorite restaurant, which is the Underground Railroad in Toronto. And it's not gone now, but I walk in and there's Ella Fitzgerald in a rhythm section. And they say, hey, bass player, come on over, join us for dinner. So I had dinner with Ella Fitzgerald. It's amazing. You know, it's uh, what a sweet lady. Wow. She was really, really nice. You think of the the artiste like all the great people that you've heard of. Yeah, there's some bastards, but but most of the time they're really, really, really nice people. There was a cellist when I was in school, uh, not in school, he was a professional cellist named Rostropovich, and he came to do a master class at, at University of Toronto. And What am I doing, a bass player in a cello master class? But anyway, I went to listen to the guy. And for him, it was all about putting your finger in the right place and why. It wasn't just enough to put your finger in the right place. You had to know why. Okay. And and I learned how to practice from him because he said, okay, when I have a piece that I've never played before, I sit down and I don't try to play it at all. I just try to go through it and listen to it in my head and, and put fingerings down on it if I need to, something difficult. And he may study it for, for an hour or two before he even picks up his instrument to try and play it and, and save so much time. Oh, that it just, when I learned how to do that, it was, oh, I, I was learning things at three times the rate that I did before. Wow. Yeah. And, oh, another good story. Uh, another cellist, Pablo Casals. Never got to play with him. I'm really sorry about that. But but another wonderful cellist. And, and he used to drive his uh, cleaning ladies absolutely crazy and he'd go through like two or three a week cleaning ladies they'd all just go crazy and leave <laughs> two or three a week yeah okay. i know My i know goodness. i know that's a story and yeah. and finally his friend came over and said well what's going on you know you you can't keep a cleaning lady he says i, I don't know i'm just practicing and so it <laughs> well show me what you're doing so he sits down with his cello and he puts one Holds a cello and he's da, 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 da for hours, making sure that his first finger is going in the right place on the instrument. And it drove everybody crazy. It's like listening to a siren. Oh, yeah. Na, na, na. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, that, that sort of gives you the uh, the mindset of, of sort of, oh, maybe not as much as Casals was, but but it's it's that kind of, intensity and detail that you have to you have to get into to be able to you know play with 80 90 100 other people on stage and doing it all at once so that's interesting i appreciate you mentioning that because just as you're telling that story just thinking about how important it is to capture the small details oh. i think we get really caught up in taking a look at the grandeur of of any artistic endeavor that people have that looks amazing and, and we just get lost in that. But uh, it's really to understand the fundamentals and the basics. Huge. Yeah. I, if I can use a sports analogy, okay, football. When you start watching football, it's this great big massive bodies going everywhere, going crazy and hitting each other and jumping into piles. Of, my mom used to say like one, two, three, jump pile. But... <laughs> But after a while, you start looking at the quarterback. Okay, and that's your first clue because the first uh, when you're looking at the quarterback, he's kind of the one that the conductor. He's kind of like making sure that the uh, you know the play is going to go right, and 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 he's going to deliver the ball or hand it off or whatever. And if you look at him, you can generally tell where the play is going. 
And then after the quarterback, you start looking at different other things. Okay, there's a wide receiver. Wow, he can really run. You know, and, and that may be like uh, somebody going to a concert and looking at the conductor for the whole time and, and just seeing the back of his head, but his arms waving. And, okay, well, he's pointing over here, so I guess that's what's going to happen over here. And then after a while, you start thinking, okay, well, look at that flute player over there. Wow. Not only is she pretty, but look at she. I'm listening to what she's doing. That's that's. So after a while, you get to become involved, and it's it, it's not a long process, but it, it's it's one that you you sort of grow into uh, as a, as a listener, and it's 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 kind of neat. It's kind of neat. Just imagine the symphony like a football team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of lot of similarities between uh, sports and and music. Uh, Again, I used to tell my my students that we're athletes of the small muscles. We're not athletes of the big muscles. We're athletes of the small muscles because here we are sticking our finger on the fingerboard. Wah, da, da, da. And <laughs> the, the football player's got to learn how to catch a ball with one hand. You know? So it's 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 yeah, there. There are a lot of similarities, and the intensity and and the practicing and and it, it all goes into the same thing. Sure, the performing yeah. as well too. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, now that you're living on the West Coast and you're retired, what sort of plans you got going on for uh, for your retirement? What, uh, what what sort of things are you working on right now? Well, staying alive is a good thing. Okay. Yeah, think, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to. St- I I was just saying earlier that you know I've not been very careful of what I've been doing with my body my whole life in terms of eating and stuff, but I I think I'm gonna start taking more of an interest in in what I'm putting in my face and maybe losing some weight. The hills up here are, are daunting. Uh, you go for a walk, you know, if you get on a treadmill or walk in a city street and you could walk for three miles. If you walk for three miles on Pender, it's all up. So <laughs> you're dying at the end of it. Totally. <laughs> but I, I, hopefully I'll get in better shape, lose a little weight. I read a lot. I'm in a book club, uh, do the Socrates. Socrates takes a while. Because you've got to do the research and 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 then think about what you're going to be well leading as moderator. You're kind of out of it. You have to sort of be able to stay out of it. Just let other people talk. That's your job. But uh, it takes a while to re- to research and and but that's fun. It's fun. And then there's uh, watching the Leafs on TV. You know, oh, you're a Leafs fan. Oh yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm a Toronto guy way back. You know, what can I say? It's the glo- it's the new glory days of the Leafs coming oh, up right now. Yeah, but I, I've I've been a fan since fifty seven. So wow. like I, I had the glory years from fifty seven to sixty seven and then it's just been Death Valley since. <laughs> so it's very nice to see them. Oh yeah, very it's nice to see them coming back. Totally, I know. It's a, I'm a huge <laughs> hockey fan myself. I love the Canucks, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm starting to follow the Canucks too, and and I don't know if I mean I've watched the Leafs for for most of my life, but the Canucks they're they've got three or four really good young players that are really coming on, and my my son in law I go to games with, so he'll call me up and say, hey, let's go to the game on whatever and. I'll do a night over and no, fantastic. go see the Vancouver and the Vancouver Toronto games are epic. Yeah, I watched the last one on TV. It was it was ridiculous. I couldn't believe how many Leafs fans were there. It was noisy. Oh, yeah. I know. I, I was I was you know I, I have a my one of my retirement gifts was a, a Leaf sweater, right? Okay. Leaf jersey yeah. from the from the base section. It was great. And <laughs> they knew what a fan I was. Anyway, I wore it to the to the first game I came to the Vancouver Canucks. I thought, oh, should I be hiding? Should I not wear it or whatever? And then. Like probably at least half the people in the, in the stadium were wearing leaf jerseys. Yeah, there's thousands I, of us. That's right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Did I teleport to Toronto? What's going on here? That's right. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, like, but you're in a book club as well, too. What, yep. what book are you reading right now? Uh, it's called The Banquet Years, and it's it's a heavy read. It's it's mostly about how the impressionist era started in art and music and in poetry and and in writing from 1890s through the First World War. And it it follows uh, three or four people, you know, artists in their own right and gives their life story and making connections. The writing, it's it's heavy. It's heavy reading. And the the author's, I think, a little pretentious. He, (laughs) He tends to 
uh, make connections to people that you have absolutely no idea who they are. You know, yes, you've heard of this composer, but, oh, he knew this person and that. Well, so what? You know, it's anyway, it, it's it's an interesting book and I'm glad I'm reading it, but I yearn for a good science fiction. Oh, okay. Novel. Science fiction is yeah, yeah. genre of yeah. choice. Yeah. You know, I don't think I've asked somebody in like a ton of uh, interviews, but if, if you had a particular book to recommend to people, what uh, what would you recommend? Like, what's what's uh, your favorite uh, oh. author per se, or one of your favorite science fiction books that you think people could get into? I'm ashamed to say I hadn't read not 1984. Uh, it'll come to me. Brave New World. Brave New World. Yes, I had never read it. Everybody's read it, and it came up in the book club. He said, "Oh, okay. Let's, I've never read it, so it was fantastic. It was I'm sorry I missed it." <laughs> all these years but that was one of the book club things and and i think it's my turn next and i i have an idea about the book i want to try it's a linwood barkley book and it's topical at the moment okay all right but science fiction is your uh your <laughs> no, genre no, no, choice. not really no I, I, i'm eclectic i i i'll read anything anytime so i'll you know i read the read the canadian tire catalog too it's, it's love that good. canadian tire catalog. oh me too right around christmas time my gosh <laughs> <laughs> delightful. Well, well, my, my well, wife and I have a great, great deal of fun with the London drugs flyers that come in because yeah. we're always looking for the one really stupid ad. You know, the, like, the, like for instance, the wine, the the wine rack that's shaped like a double base. That that was that was perfect. You, you wouldn't buy it, of course, but the, <laughs> but you got to look for the real stupid thing in London drug. <laughs> <laughs> the thing nobody would ever want. That's but right. That's London right. drugs is trying to sell anyway. <laughs> On this week, thirty percent off. That's well, they did. They did fifty percent off the last yeah, time. Like, Nobody was buying it. This one's really got to go. That's it's right. Not selling for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's. I'm just getting back into reading myself. I've been taking a bit of a hiatus. And it's always uh, curious to hear people's favorite books. But I guess maybe through uh, book club, other than Brave New World, uh, any other uh, titles that uh, you've really enjoyed. Okay. Well, the one book I'm going to recommend for the next book club is is called uh, The Bishop's Man. Okay. And it's it again. It's very topical with what's going on in the Roman Catholic hierarchy at this at this point. Not that I'm Roman Catholic, but it, it's uh, it's a story of uh, priests not being very good. So I think it's going to generate a lot of discussion. That that's what I hope a book does. You know, I mean, it, it just you know you can really talk. It's like a Socrates cafe. You read something and then you want to talk about it. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've never been part of a book club, but uh, it seems like it seems like it'd be fun, actually. Choose your people carefully. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because a book club, it, it's like when you recommend a book, it's like giving a little piece of yourself to all the other people. Yep. And it's not like you could be hurt or anything, but but at the same time, it's a very personal experience. And if somebody doesn't like the book, you can take it personally. <laughs> okay. So make sure that the people. You're with or safe people, right? In a book club, okay, so that they can they can debate a book without, you know, making you feel as though you're the, a dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> totally, fair enough. Can you imagine nobody liked the book. This thing is horrible. That's Chris. happened. That's yeah. happened. Yeah, that's happened. Yeah. And it's like, but I love this book. This is my favorite book. That's right. Go to sleep right. with it every night. Again, yeah. you just gave a piece of, a piece of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and everybody went, ooh, okay. <laughs> Well, I think that's kind of a, the zest of life a little bit is to uh, give pieces of yourself and to uh, be vulnerable and put yourself out there and uh, just see what happens and be brave in the face of uh, criticism as best as you can. But That's right. Yeah. And that's Socrates Cafe hey. as well. Yeah. As well. Putting yourself out there and having, a, you know, having other people debate perhaps what you were thinking and, and uh, maybe you were them changing your mind their minds it's it's great it's terrific definitely yeah definitely i i dated a woman years ago and uh she was 29 at the time but she said i've decided so i've made my mind up i'm i'm not gonna change my mind i know how i feel about things and uh, i was a little bit younger than her at the time but i thought what a shame she... well yeah it is it definitely is because you know before the uh the last socrates cafe i really went in thinking i'm really 
hoping my mind gets changed. Um, the, the possibility that my my long standing thought about an issue could get altered tonight was yeah. was really exciting. Actually, yeah. I was looking forward to it. Did it happen? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. I, okay. I would say a little bit. And okay. so much more happened beyond that as well too. Just the the entire thought process that lasted for actually the last couple of weeks has been really interesting. But. Um, yeah, I think that it's a it's the possibility to allow to have your long-standing beliefs be changed and to be open-minded enough to allow sure. that to happen. I think is really important. Yeah. 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 Definitely. But um we're nearing the end of our time here, John. Oh, so fast. I know, it goes by quick, yeah, I know. I'm I trying know. to trying to keep it to under an hour to <laughs> as best as I can to make sure this is listenable for people. But but before we get going, uh let's just throw it back to you and is like is there anything that you want to end off on and uh, say to the people of Pender and anybody else listening to this podcast? The final word goes to you. Thank you for making Pender what it is. Thank you. I I'm having a great life and a great time. Thank you. Thank you to the people of Pender Island for making it what it is. Yep. Right on. Nice. Okay, John, thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank John very much for doing that interview. And to honor that interview, I decided I would come to Mount Menzies. So Mount Menzies is located on the North Island. And how I got here was I drove down Hooson Road and parked in the cul-de-sac and walked up through a beautiful little pathway with a ton of salal and actually a lot of fallen trees after the recent windstorms we've had here and came up to the top to a lookout point here that's unmarked but it looks over towards Saturna Island. And the reason I decided to come here was because I was thinking of an area of the island that actually had a bassy vibration, a frequency to it. And to me, every time I come here, there's kind of a low frequency vibration to it. It's the best way I can put it. And I'm not sure what it is, but I get that feeling up here. And anyway, it's a uh, beautiful Saturday afternoon, a little bit windy up here. Sun's poking out in late February, and yeah, it's really nice to be by the ocean. So thanks again to John. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Tarmigan for helping to support this podcast. And until next time.